I just make that. There we go. Is that, can everybody see that? Okay. Well, this evening I'm going to talk about what we call the adaptation and mitigation nexus. And this is really about how our mitigation determines really how much we are going to have to adapt to. But before we start that, I just want to just talk about why I'm linking these two things together. And you will have had a number of presentations relating to the nature of what's driving this problem. And I just want to unpack that a little bit. The observed impacts of climate change come from the past emissions. So what we're seeing now is actually the result of things in the past. And this is because of the lag time, which you would have heard about, and the inertia that sits in the oceans and how much of it will expand um, as a result of the warming on one hand and also the input of both water from glaciers and so on and also the, the displacement um, impact from the ice melting um, in the ice caps particularly. So what this means is that we're not only going to have to adapt to what is in the system, but we're going to have to adapt uh, also to what is to come unless we can reduce our greenhouse um, emissions. And from now on, those emissions will control the scale and the pace of the future impacts and our ability, therefore, to adapt to them. And the risks will continue to change. And so we'll be getting both an acceleration of impact and we will get um, greater frequency of impact and the sea rise will be ongoing into the next century. So we have these compo two compounding effects of what's in the system now and what is to come. And so really the timing and severity of the impacts depends on just how hard and fast we can mitigate our emissions. And we need to start that process right now. So otherwise we have a huge burden in the future. Now just, you may have seen a graph similar to this, but what this is really showing is that we're on the cusp of um, some global um, trajectories that are wide open and that where we fall on any of those pathways is going to rest with how we deal with our emissions in the future, how we continue to develop our economies and how we, can, how we actually respond to those. And so there's a number of things um, that are affecting that. Um, the the um, output will have to be, or, or if you like, the end point will have to be at this two degrees cap, if you like, um, which is in the Paris Agreement, but preferably less um, below, less than 1.5 degrees. And that means that our global emissions need to be less than zero around 2050. Now that's a huge task, um, but if we don't, recent research shows that we've, we've, we've pretty well baked in 1.5 degrees um, and that's going to bring large sea level rises and also in looking out to the future, um, there may be even larger. So what's actually ha happened to our emissions? Now this graph has, um, I think, shows really the severity of what is happening. Since around 1751, the global emissions have gone up. And these four um, uh, slices, if you like, the quarters of that, um, uh, that graph are showing huge increases in our emissions, which are linked to the anthropogenic footprint, our own human footprint on those um, increases. And so we're really in the danger zone. And the if we take come back to New Zealand and look at, say, an, an, an impact on this, since the 1900s, when we've been measuring our sea level rise, for example, this is the sort of pattern we have. And it isn't the same all around the country. Um, it is changing. But the general trend is upwards, and that's not stopping. Okay? So if we look at where we are now, which is, is down the bottom left of this graph, we have a sort of a, a point somewhere around 2040 when we get this bifurcation of the trajectories, depending on how we track in the future. 
The top one, of course, is the 8.5 degree, uh, sorry, 8.5 um, resident concentration pathway, uh, which is sort of at the high end um, of what the world um, may reach. And we have the lower end and various ends between it. Now, what, what we, if, if, if we go to this next slide, this gives us a little bit of understanding about the fact that out to about 2040, we're pretty certain there's a narrow range of uncertainty that we're going to reach these sort of levels um, uh, around 0.3 um, degree, uh, sorry, point, uh, where are we? Yeah, point, point, um, anywhere between about 0.3 of um, 30 centimetres um, down to um, somewhat less than or just on two centimetres more of, of um, sea level rise. As we go out further, that uncertainty deepens. Um, it widens, the, the range between these widen, 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 and depending on the trajectory, we have a shorter or a larger um, um, window within which these um, uh, sea level rise scenarios are indicating the adaptation um, gap is going to be. So if we, if we just think about what adaptation, um, why this matters for how we might adapt to the changes. We've got a number of components that govern that. Near-term certainty, um, so we sort of know what's going to happen out to 2040, but we've got very great long-term certainty about some of the higher um, impacts that could occur. And of course, this is changing, it, it is accelerating, and it may well accelerate further if we get um, tipping points in the um, ice cap um, changes. Um, and some of the change in the system is already irreversible, and so we've really got a very small window to act or to stop it, and that will have to happen over centuries. But unless we make really big impacts at the beginning and now and get on with it, um, we're going to lock ourselves into huge problems in the future. And so the IPCC talks about this two degrees as a guardrail affecting how we live, transform our behaviours and our technologies. And that two degrees is not very far off. And certainly 1.5 degrees is not very far off. But there's a big difference between what we might need to do if we can keep our emissions down to 1.5 compared with two degrees. So to address this challenge, we have really to transform the way we govern and plan the systems. And that is part of the change that is needed as well. And so that's no mean task. But just to run through how we may think about this. With a risk that's accelerating and changing, it means that anything we do to adapt now is going to have a lifetime. It's not going to last forever and the performance of it will decline. Now this pictogram is, is showing how we can undertake some action today on the left-hand side, and the ability of that to perform over the long term will decline as storms frequency increases and as um, our um, adaptation, um, the, or, or, or as, as our sea level rises in the, this particular case. And so we'll get out there in a, a point where we'll reach some sort of threshold, some sort of point where we really our systems are not operating for us. So like, for example, seawall is not going to last the distance as the sea level rises. The um, A number of other adaptations that we've traditionally been doing are not going to really lead us to um, a future that's going to be very pleasant. We're going to be flooded more frequently. Um, there'll be more storms that will affect us more frequently. And so we need to think back from that about the time that it would take to adjust in other ways. And that, that other way may be progressively moving back from the coast. Um, it may be um, undertaking um, natural um, systems changes for temporary measures to protect our coastlines, for example. But we will get to a point where we have to have a lead time to undertake an adaptation or a number of things that will enable us to not reach that threshold, and in other words, avoid that damage in the future. And to do that, we need to design signals. In other words, we need some sort of warning ahead of time. So that just gives you a picture of 
what will happen as sea level rises and the sorts of things we need to be thinking about. Now, I thought what would be helpful would be to just give you a picture of the types of impacts that the systems, um, the, the, uh, the, the types of impacts that we have as a result of sea level rise um, and what some of the other impacts are that are of a similar nature and are different. For instance, the emerging, what we call the slowly emerging impacts, like sea level rise, uh, rising groundwater as a result of that. We get widening climate variability that is impacting us. And we get um, slow moving temperature increases, which cause droughts, increased flood, flood and storm frequency. And some of these come as very large impacts through the extremes, through the big cyclones that pass through us, usually at the beginning of a year. Um, but not always. Um, we also have what we call surprises, which, for instance, if we get accelerated sea, um, sea level rise from the collapse of um, ice, sheet, ice sheets in the, in the Antarctic, for instance. And a number of these will be happening concurrently, and they will compound, and they'll also cascade across space and across our um, economic and social domains. So if we, if we look at what is affected, these are the sorts of things that will be affected at the coast through the changes that are happening in the Antarctic and also in Greenland. Um, planning at all levels will be affected. All coastal no-lying areas. And importantly, our services that supply us with water, wastewater and stormwater. A little example, um, close to where I live, 30 centimetres of sea level rise is a, is a tipping point for the functioning of um, stormwater and wastewater infrastructure because it's gravity fed. And so thinking now about how long we have to design a new system or to redesign our cities um, is critical because otherwise we have all the impacts occurring at once and we're not going to be able to cope with them. So long-term planning, and we also have, as, as many of you will know, a deficit in the maintenance and uh, repair of some of these throughout New Zealand, um, as we saw um, last summer in Wellington. Um, we have transport facilities at low-lying areas or cities and our settlements function and depend on our infrastructure, which are going to be affected. Also our rural land uses and the infrastructure that supports them. And importantly, the finance sector, the, the impacts into the finance centre through people who want loans for infrastructure, for example, um, will be starting to think, well, are these going to be bad loans? Are they, are, or do they require um, um, particular conditions on those loans in terms of length of time and the risks that the banks might be holding long-term mortgages, for example? There's also big implications for how we um, design policy and the governance. Now, just to give you a picture of the size of this, this was some work done under the Deep South Science Challenge um, by um, colleagues at NIWA. Um, and it gives you a little bit of an idea of the um, infrastructure at risk um, on the coast and the levels of sea level um, that become critical for the um, costs that we will have, we will incur. And without going through all the detail, you can see that, that see the detail on the diagram, the 50% of our exposure is in areas less than three levels, three meters of sea level rise. And the, in the first 100, well, sorry, in the first one meter of sea level rise, there is an enormous amount a very large cost, and most of the exposure is occurring in Canterbury, Hawke's Bay, Bay of Plenty, and the Waikato. And what this is telling us is that near-term adaptation is needed now, in the next few de decades, to address this exposure, because communities cannot function without the infrastructure that is at sea level, or virtually at sea level. And this has an enormous cost. The local government, New Zealand people, put some figures on it, and um, you can see the distribution of costs across the regions in New Zealand from this table. But they are significant and they are large. And we have an incomplete picture of what the financial burden is. Um, and that is slowly building now 
So if we look at what adaptation is, it's, it's really a process of adjustment to what, we ex what the actual impacts are now and what we expect them to be in the future and the effects that that causes on our human and natural systems through our human intervention. So adaptation is a human intervention. We're not talking here about what we call autonomous ad adaptation, which is the natural changes that occur in a matter of course. This is about what we're going to need to do um, to address that burden um, that I've just been talking about. But at the moment, the dominant um, um, actions and adaptations that are taken are reactive. We tend to do them after something's occurred, after the damage has occurred. And then what do we do? We put people back at risk because all our funding systems are geared towards getting people back to normal. And that's a problem because what we all we're doing is going around in a circle and that's that that circle of decision making is going to become smaller and smaller in the future because the frequency of these events will be occurring and the frequency of exposure will be occurring um, increasing um, over time. And we don't want to be paying for this because that's going to be putting money that we could be spending on avoidance and um, future-proofing our communities so that we can decrease that burden. Because as it increases, it is going to become unaffordable and not everybody will be able to be protected. So what we're talking about here is really planned adaptation, um, which rather than necessarily making incremental adjustments and thinking that we're somehow accommodating the hazard, all we're really doing is waiting for the next disaster and that, that next disaster will be bigger if we continue to uh, um, allow development to occur in these at-risk at areas. So what, what really is needed is a paradigm shift and it's really urgent to avoid future exposure to the risks in the same place and it may in some places require staged retreat of critical facilities, um, some communities um, and we will have to be able to pay for that. And that is a big question. So we really only have a small window to get prepared. Okay, so moving from really a pretty doomy, uh, doomy and gloomy future, how can we shift to more anticipatory planning? And the key to that is really understanding how to work with uncertainty. And there's a, there's, there's a number of questions that we, uh, we can ask ourselves. What are the sort of future conditions when the sort of strategies we've got now will fail? And how sensitive are an, a range of options to different scenarios um, that we might think will occur in the future? And a really critical um, question is, do the options we're considering lock in a path dependency that we will find very expensive to get out of in the future? And importantly, are there alternative pathways? And in, in identifying alternative pathways, we think about what are the conditions under which we could change the pathway? And so we think, like the top left um, diagram, we think about this in a bit like getting on a train at a metro station. We have a number of ways of getting to our objective in the long term. And the first of those um, actions, if you look at action B, that will only take us a little bit into the future. Depending on what the scenario is, which is the bit down below it, there's a number of changing conditions there which are represented by a scenario. And we can chart a course through that and identify the conditions under which we might move from one pathway to another. And this is what we call a, a more dynamic approach to pathways planning for the future. And if we look at the um, coastal diagram on the top right, this gives us a picture of how we can move through different options, um, identify some signals that warn us of when we need to move, some trigger points when we need to make decisions, and then make the movement to another pathway, which might be more um, enduring over time. And to do that, we can, we can test those different options and different pathways against different worlds. 
And the bottom diagram is an um, example of some different worlds under different climate um, and economic conditions on the left, what we call the resident con um, concentration pathways. And those identify different worlds with different assumptions in them about the future. And we can pick um, a number of those and use those to test our um, different pathways and whether or not they will get us there. And what this enables us to do is to make early decisions that are more robust over a range of different conditions that might occur in the future. And so therefore, this breaks down a, a, the, the idea of a linear way of thinking about the world and enables us to be able to make shifts over time and confidence to make decisions now that we know we can move from or that may be more robust under different um, conditions in the future. So that's one tool we have, um, which has been used in a number of occasions, and I'll show you some examples in a minute. To do that, um, we also have developed um, a number of steps in a decision cycle to think about how in these really difficult contested situations on the coast, which is being affected by what's happening in Antarctica and Greenland um, with sea level rise, which is going to be ongoing, we have a stepwise process with people at the centre. And unless, and unless the, the people are involved in an ongoing way in an engagement with the um, decision makers and can, can offer insights into how they can adapt and adjust and what the values are that they have on different places and spaces we can't really develop this much we, we can't make robust decisions so we have this process about asking what's happening what matters most to people what can we do about it and that's the um, setting out of various options and pathways and how can we implement the strategy like developing an adaptive strategy and then monitoring it and how and asking how is it working. So it's really an iterative process as the world changes and as we get new information um, and we can re-enter that, that cycle um, in any place depending on where we're at with our decision making. But that, I have to stress, is a perfect world and the world's not perfect. And so it will be an iterative pro process and the, the drivers of change will be uh, changing over time. And so will people's values be changing over time as those impacts become more severe. Now, we did one of these exercises in the Hutt River back in about 20, 2015. And we came up with some simple a simple set of options. We did the processing um, through the um, checking against different scenarios. And we came up with a very simple um, exercise of what the main impacts of that were in terms of relative costs and whether or not the effects actually addressed the problem in the target area. And these, these helped the council um, make some decisions about the future of the Lower Hutt River strategy for completing the flood risk management plan there. And this enabled the community. The community was involved after the options were, were put together and they had gone through a um, multi-criteria analysis and the, the preferred options were put out um, to the community and they provided um, feedback. And that feedback was um, taken, taken note of and the council made the decisions based on the information and the preferences of the community. And that involved, um, as some of you may know, that involved the purchase of property on the uh, western bank of the Hutt River in the Farrison Street area. And many of those have since been purchased. Now, th this is a particular case where there was a Public Works Act. There was a public work um, underway, which was moving stock banks, okay? And that the, room, the river needed more room, and there was a Public Works Act that had certain conditions and so forth. And that was a much easier situation than on the coast where we don't have the Public Works Act operating um, in the same way. And so we don't have all the tools yet, particularly the funding tools, to deal with this at the coast. We have done um, a similar exercise in Hawke's Bay um, through the Resilient Science Challenge. 
And um, this is just one particular example where a very simplified pathway was developed in terms of short, medium and long term um, actions. And this is now being um, developed for implementation currently. Uh, the coast was divided up into a number of um, uh, parcels or units, if you like, and um, different options and pathways were looked at with a community panel um, to come up with preferred ones which were recommended to the councils, which they finally um, agreed to in principle to develop up an implementation plan, which is still in the process. So um, this this is, is not exactly new um, and we're, we're still feeling our way in terms of what the lessons are being learnt from these sorts of um, exercises. We have also um, developed work here on just how one might design these signals and triggers before we develop adaptation. Um, we, you know, work with communities to identify adaptation thresholds. And as you can see, they traverse a number of domains from physical indicators um, through to cultural, social, environmental and economic ones. And the primary indicator at the moment is, in fact, the insurance markets. Um, we're getting warnings already. Um, in some places around New Zealand are not already um, uh, have withdraw um, are not providing insurance for new part new buildings and in, in risky areas, and so there is already a warning in the system. And the the process is to really think about what that means and identify what would be the conditions under which the trigger would be made to make a decision ahead of reaching that adaptation threshold. And in thinking about that, the, um, the monitoring framework around that um, is, is critically important to monitor the, both the signals and the triggers. And um, we've developed, a, if you like, a, set, a staged way of thinking about um, how to uh, identify thresholds, um, triggers and signals. Um, through a process of uh, deliberation with communities and with the technical people and councils particularly. And what, what you'll notice there is that it's very important that the monitoring has a home and has an owner. Um, the responsibility um, will need to lie with somebody in a council. It is not something to be forgotten about. It is a bit like managing risk and audit. Um, within a, a, a large corporate or within a council where responsibilities are clearly defined, KPIs are implemented, um, and there is some sort of managing and reporting to those who can make the ultimate decisions. And unless you have these things set up, the adaptations are very unlikely to be successful because the world is changing and they do need to be monitored. And so this sort of regime of thinking about monitoring has to be really embedded in the way, th way we do things around here. And once you do alert, there has to be a review process and activate the successive actions in that um, decision uh, circle that I outlined earlier. So this comes to my last slide, which is really, how does adaptation happen? Well, it doesn't happen by itself. It requires an understanding of types of hazards and risks, and the communication of those is extremely important. Um, people find it quite hard to um, understand a risk that is not yet visible to them, um, although we do have examples where um, attributed risk from climate change is visible, um, but we need to be able to communicate that to our communities. And the, probably the most important part of this whole process um, going forward is trust building with communities through ongoing engagement. And just as an um, anecdote, the, uh, the process we undertook within Hawke's Bay was as much about building trust between communities and councils um, than it was about coming up with a solution. And it took months. And the reason it takes months is because in the past, and even now, communities don't feel heard. They don't feel as part of the process of the decision making. 
And unless that can be motivated through leadership um, within our decision-making bodies, we're going to have a problem going forward. So to do that, there are, the engagement process involves experiential learning, and that is at the heart of the adaptation process. And to do that, we need fit-for-purpose um, policy frameworks, plans and tools. In other words, um, time to have that deliberation and tools and plans that can enable us to implement them. And we also need, importantly, funding mechanisms to support those processes and to support whatever adaptation comes out the other end of them. And that really requires um, a partnership and ownership between communities and um, governments and also the private sector. And what, so what the work that I've been involved in, um, along with my um, colleagues in NIWA and Landcare and through Deep South and Resilient Science Challenge, um, is really to come up with ways of thinking about these problems, uh, communicating them and coming up with uh, ways in which we can get consistent practice, but yet practice that still protects the individual um, places and spaces that we have in New Zealand that we all value. So I'll end on that hopeful point, um, because while we have an enormous problem ahead of us and a really big challenge, there are ways that we can work together to achieve um, a better world in a really warming climate and also to mitigate, importantly, mitigate our greenhouse gas emissions as an urgent priority. So thank you. Really, really interesting. And it's interesting to see that the framework and tools for for local, you know, local government and government to actually address the problems. But the 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 way I see it is that with the, with that sort of classic hockey stick graph of, of the key indicators, you know, the CO2 or greenhouse gas concentrations, sea level rise, temperature rise, uh, my feeling is that, that you can have the same sort of graph for the cost of mitigation and adaptation because the longer we leave it, the, the dramatically more expensive it gets. Hmm. I, I don't see any questions on the, on the channel, but I, I have a sort of a sort of a question. A lot of people sort of look at climate change and they accept that and they say, well, what can I do about it? And a lot of that response is focused on I can't hear you, Ken. Oops. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can hear you now. No. The sound has gone. Okay, how's that? That's better. Yeah. Okay. Well, a lot of the so the personal responses has be, have been around you know what what can I do about it and it's it's yeah. very much focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, which mm. will fix the problem in twenty or thirty years time. But the the sort of personal drive to to make changes now um, is is not focused, and I just wonder how much of that is. Uh, or how much the will to change um, is resisted by just the sheer volume of investment that we have in coastal properties, you know, both public and private. Yeah, I, I, I think um, some of these processes that I talked about, like in the Hawke's Bay and at, at, at the Hutt River, um, have been starting to get tra traction at a local level with councils. <clears throat> I know of several councils who are developing um, adaptation plans currently, and there are small communities like um, Makara in Wellington who undertook one of these exercises. Um, and that was conducted over, a, I think, a six month period, whereas the Hawke's Bay one was over a much longer period. Um, there's, there's an exercise that started up in the Kapiti Coast um, which is doing a similar thing. So I think in terms of what people can do, um, there are um, resources available um, for, you know, I don't mean money resources, but, but more um, tools and um, 
uh, things like games, um, serious games that are being used with communities and there have been some developed specifically for Māori communities. Uh, Niwa has been doing that work with, with them and with land care. And um, the, so there, there are a number of tools available from our research that are being disseminated amongst councils who are taking up the challenge and working more, um, more with communities now. And I think um, with the if, with the institutional frameworks that have been set up under the Climate Change Response Act, um, for a clear expectation that a national adaptation plan is going to be developed, which is currently underway, um, that communities are going to come in behind that and develop their own, which will be helpful in terms of implementing, um, you know, the challenge that I've set out. So I think I think things are starting to move, um, but I think what we need is a great bigger um, effort in pulling together all that information in one place where people can get access to it, <laughs> um, and more people in the councils um, training themselves and working with communities. But I, I think the you know the penny is starting to drop because the resources in the regions are in many cases just not sufficient to be able to deal with more and more of these disasters. So they're gonna to have to um, work, work that one out either partly by themselves, but inevitably um, funding mechanisms developed by the Crown, um, by government um, will have to be developed because otherwise the vulnerable are the ones that are going to be without the resources are going to suffer. And those with money um, will, um, of course, have impacts, but have more leverage um, into a, um, a system. So there's going to have to be um, criteria against which funding is made available for this. And one would hope that the most vulnerable and um, communities are going to have um, a good share of that. <laughs> So, I think that sort of, that then becomes a tension between the small local governments and the central government. You know, to say, well, we simply can't do it on our own. We we definitely need some help. So, is the, is your sense that there's there's building or, or there's sufficient political will to um, to address the problems to to make the funding available? And well. <laughs> It's an awkward question right now with an election coming up, but uh, what's your yeah, feeling? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think I think um, it's widely recognised that reducing our emissions is necessary, but it's not sufficient. And I think we saw a cross-party agreement on the Climate Change Response Act, which has adaptation in it. So I think that's a signal, um, and I think that. It's been made very clear um, at political levels that climate change is a huge issue going forward. Um, it could potentially dwarf Im impacts of COVID um, and it's going to result in stresses and strains on international fund, you know, fund availability because this isn't just happening in New Zealand, it's happening all over the world. So it's it's it, it's a sort of super pandemic, if you like, <laughs> and it's 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 going to require a lot of thought about who pays, how they pay, and how you design that um, funding system uh, so that there is justice and fairness in that system um, for those affected. Uh, but my my reaction to your question, Ken, is really that. Let's start now. Let's get going. Um, otherwise, we're going to miss the boat. And um, sorry about the analogy, but <laughs> the 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 world is going to be looking after themselves. And unless we work together with our colleagues internationally and also in New Zealand, come up with new, unique New Zealand solutions to our problem, you know, we, we've got a difficult future ahead of us. But there are opportunities to do stuff now. You know, we are investing a lot of money in infrastructure right now. And unless we future-proof that for sea level rise, 
and for other um, you know extreme events that we will, will like droughts and floods and and um, um, potential you know pest incursions into our native forests um, and so forth we 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 really need to think out that plan very carefully so agencies like the infrastructure commission um, have have um, a very real responsibility to be thinking about the impacts of climate change on those investments and how they can be managed long term and by whom um, because we don't want to be putting out and transferring all the risk out to future generations um, you know that's not not what our country is really stands for so i i think that um you know, there's plenty of signals around that there is a willingness to do something. And I think the parties need to come together right across the board at local, regional, national level to um, come up with that long-term adaptation plan and fund it adequately. And, and as you said in your presentation and in the news today, that uh, that it, it involves, you know, the community and the, and the sort of the... the uh, the local or the government level, and you know all the all the parties coming together with a, a sort of a common uh, a common theme, common goal. Yep. I do have a question from Germana Nicklin. So, how yep. useful are the council's climate emergency statements for generating momentum for adaptation work? Yes, thanks, Germana. Um, the the inevitably the um, actions that are taken outside you know, government by people on the ground have had an enormous impact, in my view. I think the um, there has been a bit of a sea change recently. Um, well, over the last two or three, four years, there, there's been a gradual sea change of people demanding action. Um, councils have, um, I think the figure is something like 60% of, of New Zealand population is covered by um, these emergency declarations. Um, one could be cynical about that and it could be seen as tokenism, um, but I think it has had an impact and we can debate whether they are emergency, whether we are an emergency or whether it's a disaster. Um, but at the end of the day, I think public pressure, as we've seen for decades, has an impact on decision makers. Decision makers will follow the people. Um, they're all often reluctant to get ahead of people, but that's the nature of politics. And um, so I think it has had an impact um, both globally and I think in New Zealand um, because it has generated some action around councils developing, starting to develop climate change action plans um, Sometimes it's one step forward and back um, and the judgments have to be made about how far they can go because it costs money. Um, but again, I think it comes back to prioritising what are the most important things to do now as opposed to things that we could leave to do for a little while. So we need to do some rather more nuanced prioritising around what needs to happen now and what needs to happen in the future. But definitely, I think it's made a difference. It's changed the nature of the conversation. Yeah, and it's given them the the nudge, and that's where they they've engaged you and and really uh, built on the work that you've done, and they uh, and the you know the sort of the tools that you've the tools and evidence that you've given them. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't see any more questions, so, um, <laughs> so I, think, I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. Um, okay. Thank you very much. And um, I just, I don't know how many people we have there. Do you know, Ken? Uh, we've had sort of nine to 10 watching and uh, yeah. I'm certain we'll get a, a lot more over over time. That's been the way the other uh, Chronicles have gone. Uh, yeah. It has had a fairly small audience to start with, but over time it's built up and up and up. So the, uh, so we're recorded and, uh, yeah. and hopefully okay. we'll get a, well, a lot more you. Thank you for that. And um, I think the, the combination of all the talks in this particular series really provides a, um, a good overview for why we need to take action now. And we need to work that through in a collaborative way with our communities um, because there are things we can do. And we certainly don't want to make it worse by bad decisions now. <laughs>
So thank you, Ken. Good one. Thanks very much, Judy. So this is the so the last. Uh, this concludes the Antarctic Chronicle series, and uh, so we hope if you've seen the series, you've uh, you've really enjoyed it. I've found it really really interesting, and it's given me a lot more uh, a lot more sort of uh, body of evidence or something to uh, to you know to sort of make the make the case for climate change and and. Uh, uh, so anyway, that's that's put on uh, from the Antarctic Society. So we encourage you to look up the uh, the Antarctic Society uh, website, and uh, if uh, you're interested at all, uh, please join us and uh, and engage in the, in these sort of activities. So thanks very much to everybody, and thanks very much, Judy. Thank you.